Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. What do the narratives of Exodus and Daniel have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why were these stories understood historically as penultimate readings during Easter week? What is the common thread that connects these texts with gospel accounts of Christ's passion? If you've noticed that all of these stories feature oppressive kings, you're on the right track. Richard and I discuss the meaning of Pascha in light of Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. This week's episode is in loving memory of Ralph Sergi. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 65 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Father, on Holy Saturday, when we were doing the Old Testament readings, you gave a sermon and you brought up a curious point about the three youths and the readings about Nebuchadnezzar. How peculiar some people find it to be talking about the Babylonians on Easter. It was funny. So can you help explain what this reading is doing here in this part of the lectionary? Well, I think when people come to Pascha in a modern Christian pseudo-psychological, pseudo-philosophical context, where they have all kinds of ideas and theologies about what Easter means to them and what it means about life, they expect to come and celebrate those things. They want to hear about how now they get to live forever They want to hear about how happy things are going to be now that Jesus has reversed death. I mean, this is they think about it in these very self-interested ways, which is a sign of the times, frankly. And I think when you approach Pascha with this mindset, what can I get from the resurrection? What is in the resurrection for me? What can I take away from this for me? How does the teaching of the resurrection in the New Testament really show the validity of our liturgy? This is the way people think. Unfortunately, it is a bit shocking, perhaps even disappointing for some, that the main central readings appointed for, you know, what the Copts call the Saturday of Light, Sapta Nur, you know, the Holy Saturday, that these readings deal with narratives about tyrannical kings in the Old Testament. I mean, people assume that the lengthy reading from Exodus is meant to feature the connection between the Eucharistic meal and the sacrifice of Jesus and the Jewish Passover. Now, the connection is there. It's implicit through the readings from Hebrews that we've been hearing all along. But Hebrews itself is focused not specifically on the lamb who was slain, but on why the lamb was slain, to what end, which is a confrontation with the power of death. Paul is very explicit that through Jesus Christ, you are set free from fear of the power of death wielded by Satanas, who in the New Testament represents human tyranny, human power structures, represents human beings asserting authority in the face of God, against God by asserting themselves. In the Exodus readings that we have, it's not just highlighted that the people were set free from earthly tyranny, but they actually lied in order to try to get themselves back under earthly tyranny and said, we told you back in Egypt that we didn't want to come out here to the wilderness. They never said that. They actually were crying out, and that's why God decided to free them from this earthly tyranny. So there's something about the hold that earthly tyranny has over the people that not only can't they free themselves, they don't want to free themselves. And I think that theologians, when they hear the Exodus reading, they get excited about Jewish liturgy and about the word Passover and about how ancient our rites are and all of these Eucharistic connections they have in theology and so forth. 
this is not, I mean, it's an aspect of the text, but it's not the main feature. The main feature is this confrontation with tyranny. And I would even say that they assume very often that the stories of Exodus and the stories of Daniel are metaphors that are applied to the resurrection. But I think they have it backwards. I think that the resurrection is pointing back to what's happening literally in Daniel and Exodus, which is a confrontation with human tyranny. Chrysostom talks about it very clearly in his Paschal Homily, which is read in Eastern churches every year. He talks about being set free from the power of death. And in the passage that he quotes where this famous you know, Greek word, abichranti, embittered, I mean, he borrows from the Septuagint language about the day star that fell from the heavens. So we understand that hell swallowed Jesus and couldn't digest him. But in Isaiah, in the passage he's quoting, the one that caused the bitterness when he fell down from the heavens was the king of Babylon. Chrysostom was no dummy. I mean, in the narrative of his sermon, the king of Babylon, is his power is being supplanted even in hell. So that Nebuchadnezzar is denied the privilege of souring the belly of hell. That is an honor bestowed to Jesus Christ, who is the bitter pill that can't be swallowed and so forth. They're all beautiful poetry. But it all points back to the fact that the central theme on Pascha is not what do you get for believing in Jesus. The central theme is what is God doing for your sake to set you free from the power of death wielded by kings and empires and dictators and abusive authorities, and above all, wielded by you, the addressee of the text. And when we look at Hebrews, and we talked about the Hebrews passage and the famous cloud of witnesses from the Hebrews passage that we read during Lent, in studying that, we realize that it's not just a cloud of witnesses that are saying, yeah, you guys are all right, you know, we're just testifying on your behalf. No, what they testify to is their faith that God can take care of them that God can save them, that all these people, even without the crucifixion and resurrection that we have described in the New Testament, they had full faith, and by faith we emphasize trust, that God is going to take care of them in the face of whatever comes. Now, how did they end up? Dead, every one of them. And all the things they had to endure. Paul in Hebrews goes through the whole list of everything they had to endure. So what did they get out of it? I'm not sure how much they got out of it. But what you say is precisely correct, that it's what is God doing on their behalf. And these people already trusted that God was doing on their behalf before they knew about the crucifixion and resurrection. And this is what Paul was using in Hebrews to shame the audience. Well, listen, this is what Paul's talking about. We were talking about this passage earlier today. Then Nebuchadnezzar, whose name, by the way, means protect the crown. It's a very interesting name. So obviously, like all human tyrants, like the people attending the services, we're all interested in our own survival. It's the classic prophetic problem. If you don't know the prophets, you don't know what Christianity is. You cannot understand anything. Human power exists to preserve itself, which is why Paul attacks the power of death through the lamb who was slain. Because how can the power of death deal with someone who's already willing to give in? This is classic biblical methodology, if you will. The Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, he was upset, remember, because there were these three young men who would not worship the effigy that he set up. In rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? It's so beautiful in its clarity. It is the tension and the confrontation over idolatry linked to human power and might laid bare once again for everyone to hear and for everyone to understand if they have ears to hear and they're willing to hear. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God? It's a classic question. It's the same story as Exodus. 
It's the same story as Israel and the Minor Prophets, the Book of the Twelve, again and again. Whom do you trust? You have this force of human ego who wields an army and wields palpable might who could wipe you out in a second. And he's taunting you. What God can save you? And to even further emphasize that point, what God can save you from me? He's putting himself above the level of any God. If I put you in the furnace, what God's going to save you then? I wield the power. What God wields power like that? Nebuchadnezzar is putting himself on the level of a God, effectively, just when he makes that statement. That's why when Bill Maher makes fun of the Bible for its critique of worshiping idols, it's a ruse because he presents himself as Nebuchadnezzar. He presents himself as your reference. He doesn't want to argue with you about worshiping idols because he wants you to worship him. It's classic. Anytime someone says that God is foolish, they're implying that they are more wise than any God you can come up with. Therefore, they're placing themselves on the level of whatever authority or whatever deity you happen to have in mind. This is classic idolatry slash kingship in this sense which of is why, Which is why Bill Maher has to make fun of his Jewish heritage. Because if the people are told not to worship idols, they're not going to watch his show. Or they're not going to take him as seriously. In the passage of Nebuchadnezzar, it's not about some ideological war between atheists and believers. It's about the question of trust and whom you fear. It's very important. Listen to the response of the three youths. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, and I love this verse. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter so defiant. It's powerful how defiant they are. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So this is their trust, their absolute conviction that they're going to lay it all on the line and put their lives in the hands of the God of Abraham. But here's the killer phrase. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And this, as you pointed out earlier, is the heart of the matter. They are not taking a stand on scripture based on achieving a specific outcome for themselves. They are not walking into the crucifixion with guarantees of resurrection. They are simply saying that we have already chosen our king, and since we serve him, you can't control us, you can't manipulate us. And even if you give our bodies over to be burned and you destroy us, you did not rule over us. This is essential for understanding what it means to put trust in this God. They put their trust in this God not because of the miracle he performed or even the miracle that he will perform. They understand there is no guarantee that he's going to save them. But just the fact that he could or he can, they put their trust in him. And they undermine the statement of the king saying, I have complete control over you. No, there's one who has control. He's the one who says we live or die. Now, What's he going to say, live or die? That we can't say. But he's the only one who says whether we live or die. You, you know, you do this thing, but there's one who is more powerful than you. And this is the assurance with the lack of assurance that one has when one approaches biblical judgment before the God of Abraham, which is that, yes, he can always save you, but that doesn't mean he will save you. But it doesn't matter because he has promised you that if you put your trust in him, you'll never be anyone's slave. And that's the freedom that is essential about this. And that's why we read so much about the passion of Jesus, because the passion of Jesus is the playing out of the two authorities, the biblical authority of God the Father and the authority of the world empire, Caesar who has the ultimate power. And this is what's being played out in the passion. That's why the passion is so essential for us. I've talked to people who say, oh, you know, we shouldn't have Jesus on the cross because we worship the resurrected Christ, not the crucified Christ. We talk about, and you talked about in your sermons, Father, the problem of everyone's rush to get Jesus off the cross during the passion. And that's because we can't face 
the possibility that maybe Caesar actually is more powerful because this is what Jesus is proving when he's dead up on the cross, that maybe Caesar is the one who's more powerful. If these three youths had been burned up, maybe Nebuchadnezzar was right. Maybe no God can help. And this is the dilemma that God had even during the Exodus, because he says, you know, I'm sick and tired of these people complaining. Maybe I'll just eliminate them. And Moses, I'll just raise up a new people from your seed. And Moses said, but you know, if you do that, everyone's going to say he couldn't help them survive in the wilderness. And so God had to relent and say, all right, the only way the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord is if I keep my people alive. I've got no choice. The whole thing is about power. It's about power. The whole thing's about power. Jesus on the cross is defiance of power. You can kill Jesus, but that's all you can do. You can't make him say or do anything. You can only take his life. And the ultimate proposition of scripture is that all life is in the hand of God. So even that power that Caesar seems to have will be taken away as we hear in the story of the talents. You and know. having Moses approach Pharaoh with simply a staff and to have the three youths approach King Nebuchadnezzar with nothing but trust in their God and to have Jesus approach with nothing except faith, trust in his father without even words. How dare you speak this way to the high priest? Right. He says, what did I say? All I said is I've said everything I'm going to say. When he's approaching trial, won't you say anything to defend yourself? doesn't have anything to say. He's not accountable to these authorities. Moses is not accountable to Pharaoh. These three youths are not accountable to King Nebuchadnezzar. And we today, we are not accountable to the earthly authorities. As Paul said, we follow the laws for the sake of good order, right? but for the sake of good order, not for the sake of the authority that put those laws in place. No, but it's the authority above that authority that to whom we show deference. I think it's important, too, because in an American context where rebellion is so much a part of our psychology, unfortunately, rebellion against authority, it's very easy for Christians who hear these stories or Jews who hear these stories to confuse them with the language and the ideology of social liberation, rebellion against oppressive powers through military strength or rebellion and the thumbing of one's nose against authority under the guise of who says I have to listen to you or, or I can be in charge of myself or I'm the boss of me, all this, mm -hmm. all this vain talk. This is not the freedom that's described here in the story of the three youths or in the story of the Exodus. Because the scriptural proposition is that, well, on the one hand, you shouldn't submit to human tyranny. On the other hand... If you don't submit to someone, you yourself become a tyrant. So it's not just open rebellion a la Braveheart. Or a la Peter in the garden. Exactly. It's actually not even rebellion. That's the beauty of it. You're saved from the consequences of rebellion by simply choosing a different master. And once you choose a different master, and this is the key in Exodus. This is why Exodus is so central on Holy Saturday. Once you choose a new master, your ego is kept in check and you have to submit to his household rules. Now, the power of having the God of Abraham as your master is that his rule is the love of neighbor, which means that you are free and you don't have to be afraid of earthly authorities and no one can control you. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you can do whatever you want as long as it serves or is expedient for the cause of the gospel, which is love. That's the only thing that's helpful because people would hear this and they get confused. They don't understand the difference between a martyr and a suicide bomber. There is a difference because once you no longer fear the ruling authorities, if you're scriptural, you are set free to love your neighbor. No one can stop you from loving your neighbor even under threat of execution. People confuse self-sacrifice through suicide bombing and love and service to neighbor because, well, they're both self-sacrificial, right? But serving the neighbor with your life and enduring what the authority dishes out without any fear of what he's dishing out, without any submission to what he's dishing out, 
This is where the true bravery comes from. This is where the true strength one can have comes from, but it's a strength that's only revealed when one is weakened and when one is humiliated. But the suicide bomber or anyone who uses violence as a form of rebellion, whether it's suicide bombing or classical militarism, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you sacrifice your life that way, you are sacrificing your life, but you're not sacrificing it to the God of Abraham. You are sacrificing it to another human power. It is so important. You are not a martyr because you suffer, and you are not a martyr because you sacrifice your life. You are a martyr when you sacrifice your life and when you suffer because of the teaching and your obedience to it. So you're a martyr as a witness to this teaching of love to the neighbor. And this is what you're testifying to. You're testifying to your unwillingness to submit to this authority, but willingness to trust in the God of Abraham who tells you you're supposed to love. This is what is meant in Exodus by you are set free from Pharaoh, but you're not set free per se. You are brought out of Egypt to serve God and to worship him in the Sinai. That's the key. The three holy youths are not saved just because they're nice guys. They're saved in order to worship and to continue to serve their master. And it is only by serving this master that you can live freely. Now, the reason it's so important psychologically for Americans is because the implications of serving this master, the God of Abraham, those implications demand that you bow down to other human beings. Notice Jesus didn't submit to Pontius Pilate as his authority, but in his submission to his father, he submitted to Pontius Pilate and respected his authority. This is what Paul is saying in Romans about the Roman authorities and bowing down to them. Because if you submit to the father of Jesus, you have to view even Pontius Pilate as your neighbor in the palm of God's hand, whom you have no right to fight. And so you're free and you are defiant of earthly tyranny, but not the way that Che Guevara is defiant. You are defiant the way that Gandhi was defiant, meaning no one can control you, but you don't harm anyone. Same with Dr. King. I mean, these classic cultural icons that people talk about all the time. I mean, you were sharing a saying of Dr. King about love and the ends and the means and so forth. Dr. King, in one of his talks, said that the distinction of ends and means is something we should finally move away from. Because if the means don't embody the ends, then we're doing the wrong thing. If our end is love, then our means then must embody that love. Because otherwise, this is my own opinion, otherwise you end up creating a tyranny now for an end that you made up in your head. That's what politicians do all the time. This is precisely the problem. So what Dr. King is saying is in the actions you're taking, make sure that every action you take embodies that end you have in mind. And if your end is complete obedience to the God of Abraham, then every action you take should embody that. Now, when Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier in the garden, preventing him from hearing the gospel, he can't have that be compatible with the God of Abraham who is embodied by the Torah, if you have someone who can't hear. So Jesus has to say, we're not doing things that way. King is, in his own way, expressing Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians, that you can do whatever you want. The ends do justify the means. However, they only justify the means if the means never come into conflict with the one rule of the gospel, which is love. It's exactly what he's saying. Do whatever you want, as long as everything that you do is motivated and governed by love and everything that you do produces love as its outcome, then you're free to do whatever you want. But keep in mind, all things are not helpful. I mean, I think this is clearly what Dr. King is saying. Right. I've heard so many accusations that a lot of people who are following a kind of social gospel in some ways can be spineless because they aren't willing to confront the authority they talk about how we don't need to follow this authority, but to confront the authority and allow the authority to do what they need to do against them. Exactly. You know, whether it's fire hoses or dogs or whatever, but to confront the authority, but to destroy the authority, to hurt the authority, that's not allowed because that goes against the law of love. Be it known to you, O King. Messiah Qam, Richard. Haqqan Qam. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. 
just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.